Здравствуйте, приветствую всех на In light of the most recent events, I would like to read out the letter from the team of Press Club. Press Club stays true to its principles, the declaration of the team. December 22nd, Press Club was pressed against in Belarus. It was contributing to the development of the media uh, community. It used to be a discussion meeting, discussion platform. Hundreds of master classes have taken place there, uh, world-renowned experts have shared their experience and expertise. We've helped implement dozens of initiatives uh, geared towards uh, improvement the standards of journalism in Belarus. We were guided by legitimacy and uh, open principles, uh, open uh, dialogue, solidarity. Uh, we've been building efficient communication between various actors, businesses, officials, the civil society, and the media representatives. Press Club has always been uh, part of the community uh, that was true to its actions. For five years, we've been working openly without any skeletons in the closet. Our partners and colleague tra colleagues trust us, and that's invaluable. Yuri Slutsky, Sergei Shevsky, Alex Arko, Sergei Yakupov, Piotr Slutsky are professionals uh, with a capital P. They're creators, not destroyers. They're conceptual, open, creative people madly in love with, the, with what they do. They're in love with Belarus, uh, they're in love with the high standard journalism media. Today our colleagues have been detained, they have been imprisoned. The lawyers are doing everything possible within the law to set, to make sure they are set free. We are convinced that the arrest of press club representatives uh, is a mistake. We hope that after an open and transparent check of all the facts, our colleagues will be set free and the charges against them will be dropped. Now the investigative committee has the chance to do what the law requires without launching yet another political persecution process. We thank all the uh, all those who voiced the words uh, words of support uh, to Press Club and our colleagues who will most likely will celebrate the new year at the Volodarsky uh, detention facility. Uh, you can post them, you can uh, mail them by regular mail. Yulia, Slu Yulia Slutska, Sergei Alishevsky, Alish Arko, Sergei Yakubov, Pyotr Slutsky. Uh, these are the names. You, you can uh, write the mails, regular mails through pismobel.org. Solidarity is our force. Press Club has been working and stays true to the principles. We have uh, another mission on top of those we've, we've had until now to, for, to make sure our colleagues are set free. Thank you. Right, so this is the final session on the Expert Analytical Club this year, the outcomes of 2020 and the outlook for 2021. Just a reminder that we are running the video recording, Chatham House rules, uh, Chatham House rules still apply. Uh, on preliminary notification, your statement can be stricken off the record. If you wish to say something that is not to be recorded, please, before you drop that statement or phrase, make sure you inform us and we will pause the recording. Thereby, you'll have the chance to voice whatever you wish to say without ending up on the recording. Off the record. Now, also, there's simultaneous interpretation available. So if you have an easier time following what we're discussing in English, please feel free to select that in Zoom settings. All right. I also wish to introduce our speakers of the day. That's Andrei Kazakevich, Doctor of Political Sciences, uh, Director of the Politician Sphere Institute. Hello, Andrei. Hello. We have Alexander Dobrovolsky, Senior Political Advisor to Svetlana Tikhanovska, Head of the Eastern European School of Political Studies. Hello, Alexander. Hello. Artem Schreiben, Political Analyst, Guest Expert. Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Moscow Center visiting expert, Katerina Bornukova, 
доктор на економики, академически директор Берок. PhD in Economics, uh, Academy Director, Academic Director of Berok. Gennady Korshanov, candidate PhD in, in social, so social studies, uh, ex-head of the Institute of Sociology of National Academy of Sciences of Belarus. And Anatoly Pankovsky, editor of the site of the expert community in Nasho Mnenia and Belarus, Belarusian yearbook. Uh, wishing you happy holidays ahead. Uh, same to you. Right, so the first question after the discussion is what can, can be called Belarus's main achievement in 2020 and what is its main disappointment? And I wish to give the floor to Andrei Kazakevich first. The floor is yours. No, the most important achievement, the biggest one, the way I see it is the consolidation of the Belarusian society. Over this year, we have seen something we haven't seen uh, in two and a half decades of independence, Belarus. Protest activity, people getting electoral activity, protest activity afterwards. This is the achievement that will determine the political development of Belarus for many years to come. And I also believe it is completely positive. It, it, is, it is utterly positive because it lays a great foundation for democratic development, for the construction, for building contemporary economy, modern economy in Belarus. The biggest disappointment is related to the government. Well, the strife for power to preserve the authoritarian power is clear. The intention to do that, the intention to uh, to, to, to reserve all the privileges of the financial uh, interests. So there's no surprise there, no disappointment. But the disappointment comes from the fact that uh, it's a huge number of tools uh, of leverage on the political situation on the civil society through money, through special services, through ideological apparatus. Well, the government started using the most primitive strategy, the most primitive strategies, the short-term ones that can yield some temporary effect, uh, which is preservation of power, holding on, power, holding on to power. But they're completely destructive. As for the political and social institutes, uh, the society's trust to the government and civil uh, well, the government authorities, uh, in particular, this this has been largely destructive for that trust. Okay, thank you. Well, in that case, as stated, or as, as you appear on the agenda, Alexander, what is your opinion? The upsides and downsides of Belarus in 2020. Well, the biggest upside is not uh, does not rest within the institutional domain, like the, an entity and some, some structures have well, some entities, institutions appearing. It's not it's not that. It, there has been a total change of the Belarusian society. I can uh, list you seven signs of things that people got: the, the, the dignity, the feeling of responsibility. Two, the three is hope. These three things can sweep everything away from their path. So uh, the intensity of that, uh, the hope has been uh, getting quieter recently, but it has not vanished completely. What else the society developed? This The feeling of uh, civility, of uh, being citizens. This is the main thing that happened. Uh, after several years uh, of coming to power, Lukashenko started treating uh, Belarus as, as his property. And people have been uh, putting up with that for, for quite a while. But now the people have uh, ob ob objected that they're not subjects, they're citizens, and they have the right to participate in the, in the governance. So this conflict uh, is a very good indication of the situation that Lukashenko has failed to understand completely. Uh, people revolted when they had the right. 
So there, there is this sense of, uh, well, public spirit, citizenship, uh, also there is a sign of, of a full-fledged nation emerging where its uh, symbols, artists, uh, athletes uh, are being appreciated more than a year before, than a year before when everybody was watching Russian pop music, reading Russian literature and stuff like stuff that is not Belarusian. The Belarusian stuff was believed to be below the par, was, was not up to the standard. Solidarity emerged, self-organization emerged. These are the seven signs, seven achievements, seven points of achievement of the Belarusian society. The country has changed, the society has changed. My biggest disappointment, me as a liar, uh, is the legal default. It's the moral devaluation of uh, all the uh, lawyers uh, that are my colleagues and who work in their positions in the legitimate government. Just uh, sporadic uh, resignations we've seen from them and uh, not at once. And the fact that uh, the law is no longer in, in power in the country well, some, for some reason, it sits well with most of, of, of the lawyers that are uh, in the Supreme Court, in other courts, uh, in the prosecutor's office, the Ministry of Justice. So it's a disgrace to the profession. Thank you. Artem Schreiman. Yeah, we're talking about largely the same thing, so I won't be too original in this. I'll just contribute my statement. Uh, just a nuance that I felt happy about is when the Belarusian society did not uh, opt in uh, for the dialogue, uh, for the dialogue modus uh, that the government threw at them, the violence. Uh, they did not respond uh, to violence with violence. I know that Russians and Ukrainians criticize that Belarusian protest is too peaceful, it, it lacks teeth, but I have a different conviction on this one. Uh, for a long-term traje trajectory of countries development it is best uh, if the victory or any any transformation so let, let alone victory happens with uh, as uh, uh, as little bloodshed as possible in that case they will be more organic more sustainable and they will be more traumatic or they, they'll be more or they, they will be less bloody uh, conversely so it's a great thing that the Belarusian society demonstrated this uh, feature of theirs the main disappointment, it is also with the uh, powers that be, with the ruling elites, but it's a bit different in my case. It's our underappreciation, on the one hand, the moral elitism, when the people were not uh, beating up other people themselves, uh, they, they can still rationalize their being with the authorities and with the government, with the, with the powers that be. This is not me, I'm not a riot police, I'm not the Amon, I, I just work nearby and uh, everything is fine. And we st started realizing more or less uh, how the totalitarian regime used to be, the sum is garbled. I think my connection is unstable. Yeah, Artyom, you're, you're breaking up quite a bit. Right, I beg your pardon. So what I've been saying is uh, we saw dozens of thousands of people who are morally sane, who are completely sane, not, not psychopaths, uh, not antisocial, but they still find excuses to, to still be there, to, to serve the government that commits so many uh, so many crimes. This is not me doing this, committing these crimes. This is somebody else from, from another state agency. So th this is a coping mechanism th that is up to be studied for quite a while, political scientists and psychologists. On the, on the other hand, we've uh, underestimated uh, the extent of the information bubble that people live in, uh, that uh, the, peop the people who work for the government, I mean, because uh, they're not aware of the reality uh, they uh, are surrounded by. There are some people who find excuses, who find reasons to still be there, to still serve that government. Uh, and the, there are those uh, who are not, aren't aware. Uh, the people we used to be, we used to think as, we used, used to think about as smart intellectuals, uh, well, they turned out to be quite different. Uh, they were ignorant to what's happening around. So as a person 
it's it's uh, wrong with me and uh, also um, well we haven't seen the intellectual power at least me at least i haven't okay katerina burnukova yeah i'll try to stick to the economy well it's uh, very difficult to find any achievements in the economy this year yes uh, we have a very uh, moderate gdp slump uh, given all the circumstances but that's hardly an achievement when we all know that this is most likely because of thousands of uh, deaths that could have been avoided so the COVID deaths. Uh, so the, the biggest disappointment is that in the crisis time, in the time at the time of crisis, the government went back to the conventional, traditional, habitual practices and policies, uh, supporting the outputs, uh, using the state owned enterprises, and the bulk of the all of the attention of the government was geared towards SOE support, state owned enterprises, not the people, not private sector. We found more than one and a half billion rubles to support the real sector directly from the government. But for some social things, we have not found the money, which is a huge disappointment. I believe that many Belarusians will agree with me on this one. There used to be one big point of disappointment for all of us. And I'll also second the opinion of my colleagues, uh, the moral side of the government has also disappointed us a lot. The technocrats uh, are disappointing, disappointing me because they, uh, they they believe the economic stability to be higher than the long term economic growth. Thank you. They see it as more important. Gennady? Yep, just feel free to drop the patronymic, Gennady. Right. Okay, so as for the discoveries, for the upsides, the biggest discovery this year was uh, the so-called horizontal revolution, what can, what, something that can be referred to as horizontal revolution, where many plans have come to one or have, have, have become combined, intertwined. Political stuff, political crisis, I only see that uh, as the tip of the iceberg because much larger tectonic shifts, much more profound tectonic shifts have happened elsewhere. The social consequences of digitization have surfaced. Uh, these social consequences engender uh, the social economic changes. But I'm talking about the growth in private sector representatives, uh, their ranks grow uh, the reconsideration of the value system, digitization is one of the factors, and also the opportunities uh, for self-organization because of the digital uh, domain development. That's, that's one point. Another point is the formation of civil societies, uh, civil, in, uh, civil initiatives. I'm not talking about the civil society at this point because uh, what is taking shape now something that's being formed now is the new sociality, is the new social reality. And the elements that can be referred to as habitually, the elements of the civil society, well, we would, we would be talking about different things if we were talking about just that. It's a different level. I believe that the West is looking at Belarus with a lot of interest, specifically because uh, they intuitively feel there's something completely brand new. They can feel something completely brand new because the collaborations uh, of neighborhoods, of boroughs getting together, it's the prerequisites of the new uh, new uh, institutions in the government. Uh, but they don't work, don't, don't operate traditionally politically. Corporate, cha uh, the, the corporate chats can grow to be something as trade, uh, to, be, to be something like trade unions, but they work, they operate on completely different principles than, than the unions. What the Belarusian diaspora is doing right now, shaping various or, or creating various platforms that can theoretically act as parallel state institutions, parallel governmental institutions. Uh, this uh, has also been unseen to date. 
that's one of the discoveries, but that's just one of the discoveries. Uh, just one discovery of many. Uh, we will come to realize what we've done and to complete uh, what we have been doing uh, later on. The disappointments, well, as Artyom said, is the analytical, uh, me uh, disappointed uh, as an analyst, is the underestimation of the rigidity of the civil consciousness, of the civic consciousness. Uh, the desire to see well wishful thinking basically this wishful thinking exists not just on the part of the government officials but also rank and file citizens i believe that that huge collective trauma that happened will get down to the minds and hearts of everyone and most likely information wise it, it got to their minds but the barriers that some people have built in their minds this rigidity this capsularity uh, the fear of changing uh, whatever for a bulk of the population, for quite a bit of the population, it was uh, more powerful than the uh, collective trauma. Okay, thank you, Anatoly Pankowski. In one of the uh, in one of our sessions, uh, you rec gave recommendations to the stakeholders. Maybe you can now comment uh, as to who of the stakeholders listened to your comments and then who hasn't. Well, I've already forgotten what kind of advice uh, I've been passing around back then, but hopefully not, they were not too stupid. I would say that uh, this year has been an abnormal one. The abnormalities came and went. So for this reason, people have forgotten, many people have forgotten about the achievements uh, and about the uh, big things that the government has actually achieved. So engaging in the dialogue with Katerina Barnukova here, we had the achievements. Uh, we got uh, American, uh, Nor Norwegian, and Azeri oil. If it had been a year, uh, well, normal year, we, we as experts, we, we as analysts, we've been talking about for, for a good six months after the fact. But then the pandemic started, and the election started, and the things that happened after the elections, and everybody forgot about those oil, oil shipments. Uh, well, in a more general pattern, Yes, the horizontal revolution, some social shifts, uh, stormful developments of the civic, civil society, of the civic initiatives, uh, an incredibly long protest that has been going on until now, and it's still there. So all of this, yes, this uh, these were points for, these were the advantages. Douglas North would have dubbed them uh, the initiated transition the uh, transition commencing from a natural state to open access state. He has this concept of a natural state. It is intertwined with the notion of uh, Gobbes, philosopher, uh, who is a natural state, natural status, uh, war. From his viewpoint, 75 to 80 percent of the states are still natural, natural states as, as, as they are. Natural, country, natural states, yes. In Belarus, something started that, uh, given the favorable scenario of development, uh, will uh, shift us to a different reality. As for the downsides, the disappointments, uh, well, it's, it's not even the government, it's, it's the state. Uh, not our cardboard tiger, but our government, our, our state, that during the pandemic time, it has demonstrated its uh, poor ability to cope with making the product which is uh, which is supposed to be supplied given such huge resources the product is safety uh, the, i've watched greenland the movie before in 2012, 2012 before that was, well a, a global disaster happening uh, an, an asteroid hitting the earth so the state is supposed to filter out some useful people and uh, stick them into a bunker to, 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 to hide them, to, to get them safety, uh, to survive this global apocalypse. So I have quite uh, sad observations uh, that the humanity will not save itself, the, the humankind will not save itself. It will fail during the first uh, stage uh, of filtration, of filtering out, uh, uh, getting the best and brightest uh, into that bunker. Uh, or at the second stage, delivering those best and brightest uh, into this protected bunker. And the second disappointment was the immoral nature, the legal default, something that my colleagues here have been talking about. 
their behavior is, is, is what disappointed me, the, the officials. Thank you. We have Vadim Mazeka joining us as well. Hey, hey, hey Vadim. Get connected. Uh, feel free to take the second question, voice the voice the second question. Yes, thank you, Anton. Thank you for starting uh, as I was getting through Minsk rush hour traffic. The second uh, question before I do that, uh, well, I would also like to join the words of solidarity, the statement of press club, uh, my colleagues, uh, what, they, what they have said. Uh, today's discussion is a morally important event. What What is to be, to be done after the oppression? Well, it's uh, to continue uh, on your path, uh, to not let the government ruin the plans. Because one of the first uh, thoughts uh, that I had, what are we going to do practically, is, well, I said that, no, we cannot stop these people from uh, letting us summarize the year. So on top of other things, we will keep thinking about uh, we will we'll think about keep doing keeping doing our, our work uh, no matter what comes so we've been talking about disappointments and achievements right now so any outcomes of 2020 it's pointless uh, to talk about the most important thing because uh, the answer to that question uh, the answer to that one is very obvious i believe it would be interesting to discuss everything that was uh, there uh, apart from the elections uh, the protests and the, the coronavirus these facts have been discussed uh, quite quite at length but as uh, anatoly here recalled about the oil uh, that's oil shipments that people have forgotten well where where's that oil it's no longer no, no, no longer relevant there were several very important things that have happened over the two decades before but they simply got drowned in the stream of mainstream thoughts in the flow of the mainstream so mainstream thoughts and they were not high on the agenda that was dominated by the protests okay so let's continue in that same order what uh, have you seen uh, happening importantly besides the biggest topics of 2020 andre what do you think well it's it's very important to turn on your mic first Yeah, that, that's important. Agreed. Andre, we can we, we cannot still we cannot hear you still. Are you there? Yeah, well, you, 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 can, you can force them. You can force the sound. Uh, you can force the unmute because we have a Belarusian discussion here. Okay, Artyom, mm, I'll I'll try to mute his microphone. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just find Andre and I will ban him from muting the microphone. But uh, I don't think Andre is even here. I, I mean, we, we, we may have lost him. Okay, so yeah, right. He's he's reconnecting. Maybe let's give it another few seconds. Andre. Andre? All yeah. right, finally, I'm there. Mm -hmm. Please don't unmute your microphone. Don't mute your microphone any more. Yeah. Uh, Vadim, uh, Vadim uh, could you please recall me, the, 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 remind me the question? Okay, what, what other important events, uh, uh, except for, from the coronavirus uh, and the protests that happened in 2020? What has gone noticed? Virtually unnoticed. Well, unnoticed and important. Hmm. Well, what we, what we would have been discussing if not for those well, three, three things? Well, I believe we'd be talking about the new ambassador of the United States to Belarus, the positive dynamics, positive trends, the development uh, with the U.S. Uh, what have you noticed? Well, I think it's very important that Belarus is still in the development with the U.S. Sarvalas только исходя из simply because мы были все эти политические события. Simply because of all these political events taking place. Ну, даже, даже не знаю, как-то все well, так, как-то уже смотрится как-то игрушечно по сравнению с so этими so вещами, которые uh, ты назвал. Well, yeah, it's, uh, 
So maybe Alexander, uh, anything on top of these three main aspects of 2020 you would like to highlight? That's exactly what I've been trying to do. Uh, it's uh, I've been trying to talk about stuff not on the news, uh, but uh, the, the changes that have happened according to me, according to my opinion. Uh, the reason for that was uh, the, the, the uh, reasons or the factors uh, were the COVID and the elections. But the profound reasons were in the society for have been in the society for quite a while. Uh, this approach uh, of the leader of Lukashenko to, to the country as his own property and the people's desire to be respected, it finally uh, got their dignity through. Finally, their dignity sh came shining right through. The feeling of responsibility, the feeling of hope, it emerged. The feeling, the feeling of uh, civic consciousness, of citizenship, which is the exact opposite of that uh, attitude to the to this to the country as somebody else's property is one person's property well i wouldn't really uh, highlight any other things that have gone unnoticed we, we've noticed all the, all the big stuff and bigger stuff but the protests uh, that have become a result uh, they have uh, created a new Belarus. It's, it's no longer the country it used to be. Thank you, Alexander. Artyom? Yeah, I believe that the most important process, which is quite intertwined with the main ones, it's important to single out everything else from these three. Well, it's uh, trying to highlight a, a, a topic, trying to highlight a sphere that got unaffected by the COVID uh, pandemic. The protests, uh, they have uh, influenced our foreign policy, the, the zigzag uh, with with the Russian Federation, they're quite impressive. So, during the first half of 2020, we were at the, at the lowest point since the 90s in our relations in the uh, H1 first half year of 2020. There was a failure of integration talks. There was a conceptual crisis of the integration per se. Uh, there was a failure of the Eurasian summit. Uh, with that five-year uh, program uh, of the EU development because of the oil dispute. There was a gas war, uh, there were closed borders, there was the arrest of the Wagner military, private military company. Uh, the Gazprom bank got actually seized from, from the, uh, well, let, let alone the rhetoric uh, that came along with, with all that. This was the rock bottom of the relations uh, that in two weeks or two weeks uh, from the lowest point, uh, got replaced by Russia being uh, being uh, awarded the status of holding the keys to the Belarusian crisis. Whether we like it or not, the Russian does, the, the, uh, the Russian Federation does have leverage uh, to affect the, the trajectory of the Belarusian uh, crisis. Other uh, countries do not have such leverage. Well, I, I'm talking about uh, external uh, leverage because the Belarusian, uh, the Belarusian people have that leverage, you know, the, the citizens themselves. Well, this topic is worthy of uh, quite a, a bunch of PhD theses because it shows us that in these, in these relations uh, there's qu quite a lot of make-believe stuff, quite a bit of make-believe stuff. So castles in the sand that can, uh, well, they can, they can change very sharply and drastically to, to one or the other side if the political situation changes. Uh, we should not be making far along conclusions uh, about the future development of the Russian Belarusian relations because things can happen in a fortnight. Things uh, can turn completely uh, in just a matter of two weeks. The rhetoric uh, is there, but no mutual trust uh, is there behind it. And I don't, I don't think that Russian and Belarus will ever trust each other. So I believe that this uh, huge factor will come to play next year. So it's difficult to make uh, outlook, to make the projections uh, of the future, but I think that the dramaturgy uh, of the Belarusian relations uh, will be the key to our development. Yes, thank you, Artyom. This, these zigzags are quite uh, an interesting and controversial thing indeed. Katerina, well, talking about the economy and maybe other, th other stuff, you know, some things that have not been given enough attention. Well, Anatoly and uh, Vadim have already uh, spoiled uh, the oil shipments uh, stuff that I was uh, saving up for this question. Uh, just a reminder to all of you, 
uh, before the coronavirus, before the elections, there was this uh, wonderful time when we started living without the Russian subsidies. And uh, according to some calculations, even it, it was us who were subsidizing Russia, paying a higher price uh, for, for gas, higher gas prices. Economically, it was tough. Uh, there, was, there was a slump in Q1 2020 when the Russian oil shipments did, did not come as usual. It was similar to this uh, Q2 slump in the economy when the coronavirus started. But I believe that uh, it uh, has been an important experience. You know, we, yes, we have turned away from it, but nonetheless, uh, we know how it uh, can happen because it has happened before, uh, early this year. We're not just talking about the oil. We're also talking about the Russian funding that uh, we denied. Now we are, unfortunately, we are in a, in a different situation. When the Russian funds, uh, the Russian money is, is the only source uh, of funds that we can hope for. And another thing that uh, we would like to discuss, we'd be talking about it much more, uh, if not for those uh, three factors around us, it's those uh, uh, forced reforms that the government has been talking about. Uh, the, they are related uh, to the necessity to do something. Otherwise, uh, the economy will, uh, will go crazy. The economy will simply curl up and die. And it's it's not just uh, maternity leave uh, being cut from three years current. It's the reforms that caused some of the state-owned enterprises to close, close. But still, it's a very important thing for our economy. And it's great that these reforms are happening uh, now and not, not just suspended. Uh, it's, Ekaterina, uh, this uh, experience of living without Russian subsidies, without the Russian financial needle, well, this was quite a bit of speculation. The, the attempt uh, to uh, uh, presume what, what could have happened if not for the COVID, if not for the elections. How this experience, when we, when we already have it, I mean, we can live without that. So the Belarusian economy, uh, given that uh, lack of Russian support, uh, for how long it, it would have survived? Uh, other, other any viable models uh, of economic preservation, of preserving the economy, uh, aside from the ones that have already been used? Well, it's very difficult to kill the economy in the first place. It would have survived either way. Yes, it would have been tougher, but on the other hand, uh, well, those reforms uh, that are still that, that are happening uh, because uh, the government has to implement them uh, they, they would have happened uh, and uh, the construction of the more efficient economy would have started Gennady? right i would also say that if not for our domestic political problems we'd be talking about foreign policy uh, issues, because even in the context of the contemporary political agenda in Russia, we have not been uh, fully able to contemplate uh, the Moldovan events, the elections of the new president, the new president coming to power. We did not uh, try too hard uh, to realize what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh and in Kazakhstan. Or in Kyrgyzstan, sorry. I'm lacking competence here because I'm, I'm not an international political scient uh, scientist, foreign policy expert, but uh, I, I'm not sure if it's uh, just a coincidence, it's a light trend, or it's a reasonable uh, vector of things. Uh, the change of the Kremlin policy uh, to countries that they have been cooperating with for quite a while in the ex-Soviet space. So something that uh, is bigger than me is trying to understand whether it was coincidence, uh, coincidental or it's, it's a trend. That's one point. The other point is we have not uh, been, we have not realized the outcomes of the census that uh, happened last year but uh, we don't have the opportunity to look into stuff that, that was happening. There were just uh, two, or three, two or three publications uh, about the last census. Yeah, we know that the Belarusian population has dwindled a bit. Uh, the number of people uh, with higher education almost doubled over this past decade from the previous census. But looking at this uh, more actively, more, more accurately, uh, the events that have happened this year 
There's more. There's there's more than enough uh, material to develop to, to study the developments of the Belarusian demographics. It's it's, it's fundamentally big. Uh, this 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 amount. Vadim, uh, can I? Uh, we were just uh, talking uh, with uh, Katerina uh, in the chat. One discovery that we've overlooked. Uh, we would have uh, been talking about that. It's uh, Gennady who would not have been with us because it's the political crisis uh, that. Uh, got him out of this uh, state institution that he used to work for. Uh, but now we have the pl pleasure to have him with us, uh, to listen to him and discuss with him, with him stuff. Yes, I would also elaborate a bit here uh, to the things said. Uh, I had some time to think about uh, the discoveries that have gone unnoticed. I believe one of those discoveries was the regions uh, after this whole crisis, after these events that have taken place and have transpired, uh, the, the Belarus regions politically, they have mobilized quite a bit, not, not just the bigger cities and towns, but even the smaller settlements. Uh, we, used to th we used to think that the politics there is dead, but no, it turned out that the political process is quite indicative for the country can also be happening there. Quite a revelation for me, quite a discovery for me was the events in the West almost. Uh, the western uh, uh, region of Grota, which is north, northern, to the north from, from Brest, it used to be more active politically on the protests, but this year the absolute leader is its neighboring Brest uh, oblast, at least the bigger cities and towns from that oblast. Well, there are many versions uh, uh, voiced by the expert community trying to explain that. But it's still quite strong. At some level, something has changed. Something is changing that requires further contemplation. Another thing, uh, well, it's related to the political events, obviously, but it's also quite obvious that uh, the outcomes of 2020, the medium businesses, uh, small businesses, large businesses, that have become a political entity. They have uh, actively engaged in the political process. This has happened for the first time since late 90s, uh, well, largely throughout the independence period. This, this was the first time. And so we can forecast that this is going to uh, remain this way. This is going to stay this way. Then uh, large, small and medium enterprises will влияние. ramp up their political influence. Uh, and another point, uh, on the other hand, uh, there's been another uh, point of event. Uh, uh, talking about the disappointments with the government, with the, with the powers that be. Uh, this year, we've had the first prime minister appointed uh, that did not have a serious uh, uh, management uh, experience, uh, a serious uh, managerial experience uh, or an authority. И просто uh, представителем является как бы близко к движению. Лукашенко это опять же впервые вообще. Uh, he was just a, a person from the Lukashenko's inner circle. This story. has happened for the first Беларусь, time. Достаточно uh, такой вот ну, случайный человек занимал where, uh, такую, uh, такую quite, должность. Uh, ну и, наверное, как продолжение этого всего, это такое вот интересное усиление силового блока, ну, пока мы не можем понять его глубины, но так или иначе оно происходит. We cannot understand the full depth of the political тревожность, с одной стороны, а с другой стороны, просто, опять же, удивительно, как другая часть номенклатуры, по крайней мере, пока воспринимает это достаточно спокойно. Но не вызывает какого-то Uh, trigger sabotage, any right? serious uh, uh, counteraction of sabotage. Because if we see some serious problems going on in the existing executive vertical, uh, well, it, it still does not cause, uh, does not trigger action on the part of some people. Uh, okay, thank you. There's Anatoly and there's, there's uh, Daniel Kursin and uh, Rebecca would like to elaborate. Well, quite, quite a lot, quite a lot, all uh, interesting, quite a lot of interesting things. Uh, uh, apart from the elections, but technically, 
talking about the elections, it turned out that the political leader can be shaped uh, in two weeks, it's just a, a, from a regular person to a rock star in two weeks. Importantly, uh, Trump lost to Biden, and possibly there might be some regression uh, of the tra transatlantic relations uh, will be stopped. The post-Sovieticum space was also mentioned. Indeed, uh, this uh, porridge that has been brewing for quite a while, it, uh, it has, gone, has gone over the edge uh, on the periphery of the CIS. So we are one of the five countries uh, together with Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan's revolution, the political crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh, it's very important. Uh, Kazakhstan is quite tranquil, but possibly not for a long while. Russia is experiencing problems itself. Uh, Artyom said that uh, the Russian Federation has the keys to the Belarusian crisis, but it's just running around uh, this uh, stuff, and it's uh, not able to use those keys. So the, the, these post-Soviet processes are quite tough, are quite turbulent. It, it, the, the, the nature of them is quite turbulent. This is very important. It's very important uh, to keep washing your hands and wear the face mask. And I don't really know. I would have put together a huge list of important stuff important things. Uh, it's important uh, that we've uh, seen the other side of our neighbors. Because uh, the democracy, as one writer said, uh, the democracy starts uh, not from the point of the elections. It starts uh, when the neighbors are able to agree to create, uh, say, a children's playground, something as mundane as that. It's a small-time democracy that is the start uh, to everything. It's, it's not uh, replacing or appointing the new commander in chief. So, so that's it for my part so far. Thank you, Anatoly. In this case, well, may I? May I? Alexander? Sure. Yes, the, the point raised by Gennady, uh, something that uh, other colleagues have mentioned, I believe that uh, it takes a long time period, uh, what's what's happening in the post-Soviet space, uh, to, to, to realize, to contemplate what's happening in the post-Soviet space. And it's not just uh, short-term reasons, uh, it's uh, questions of the decade and even of the century, the continuing disintegration of the empire and the reformatting of the, of the former Soviet space. Because the controver controversy, the controversy that used to unite the empire, it, it ultimately caused the empire to collapse. Uh, the, the, those controversies, those contradictions are still there. And I don't think that, uh, well, I, I would uh, treat these processes as the continuing reformatting of the post-Soviet space that has a, fa a much for a farther effect than the stuff we, we, uh, we've been analyzing until now. So Daniel, Philip, uh, who, is, who is prepared to take the floor? Well, I'm there. Okay, Daniel. Uh, hi, everyone. I would like to uh, contribute some positive points uh, on top of the difficult stuff, uh, the, the difficult points. It's, it's easy for me to say because I'm in Germany right now, but, but still. I believe that the positive points are the activization of the Belarusian diaspora uh, abroad. I haven't seen that in two and a half decades. Uh, I've, I've been studying Belarus. Uh, I have never seen, never seen that before. And the Munich, who have an initiative group of around 500 people uh, that uh, visit, that are on the news, that uh, go to protests, that visit event, attend events. In this situation, they are thinking about building the new Belarus. Uh, Afterwards, uh, they're prepared to take uh, to, to take that matter seriously. This is visible in other countries, not just Germany. And I believe this to be a brand new phenomenon. It's very important uh, to see it and analyze it. It's very important for the Belarusians uh, to work uh, with that from within and to give a channel, uh, to, to channel a constructive channel to be used by the Belarusian diaspora. The Belarusian diaspora that has uh, become active, uh, their enthusiasm, their passion should be channeled somehow. The second point is the perception of Belarus from abroad. 
when I believe uh, as, as late as early last year, uh, Belarus was only referred to as the last, the last dictatorship of uh, Europe, where Lukashenko, well, it was on the news as the last dictatorship in, in Europe, that Lukashenko is the uh, almost as well known as che, che Guevara is a pop icon. Uh, I would uh, think about it uh, last year, but uh, the foreign public did not realize what it actually means. Now they have a very different picture, a very different perception of Belarus. Of Belarus as a country where the people was, were uh, prepared to rise against the, the dictatorship of the country and the land of the brave, and the highly initiative. And uh, I know personally uh, over 20 organizations and foundations in Belarus, uh, not state run ones, but uh, private ones uh, that are actively considering projects in Belarus uh, that are prepared to support these projects, initiatives, and uh, they are. Uh, they are a part of this very important uh, potential that, can, that, that should be tapped. There, there should be links established uh, between uh, actors in the country and outside the country, what, what resources are available. And the third point, back in school days, uh, I was looking at this, the most productive time for art, uh, the, the, the broader platonic notion of art, is the time when there's a war, when there is a revolution, there are, there are transformations, uh, big time paradigm shifts happening in, uh, in the country. All the interesting literature in Germany is about the wars and about the uh, unification of uh, uh, Germany and the processes uh, that came with that. I believe that uh, that productivity that the Belarusians have demonstrated this year, productivity in creating songs and creating poems in writing the literature pieces, works of art also, pictures, uh, uh, civil initiatives, startups. Well, I think that uh, it trumps everything that came before that, the classic startups. Uh, it's much bigger than that. I believe that uh, some sophisticated reasons uh, could be behind that, but it is still an achievement that should be pointed out and it should not be ignore, ignored in, in Belarus and outside of Belarus alike. Thank you for letting me contribute. Yes, thank you, Daniel. Well, indeed, uh, when you live in the country, you don't notice stuff, uh, uh, well, poetry, literature, uh, uh, well, you, but as a, as a cultural studies expert, I would really uh, say that it's a great thing. It's very important. Uh, Philip? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Awesome. Yeah, we, we, we can see you at times even. Okay, great. Thank you for the discussion. If I may, I will use this uh, uh, upsides and downsides format. It's very convenient. The upside of the year, the achievement of the year is very, it's an easy one. As a social scientist uh, that is try, tries to study the society, the people that analyze this information that's uh, stuff that's happening in the society. The main achievement of 2020 is that finally there is some political force in the country emerging. Some political force emerged that was able to trigger political activity in people, not just uh, the core, the traditional core that used to be more or less politically active. Uh, the core that is now the opposition, the, the classical opposition, but also the people that before May 2020 used to be politically inactive. Now the political activity has been triggered. So these people take the protests actively. Uh, they've been ignoring everything before. They were kind of beyond the, polit beyond the politics. But finally, I've been happy to see that there were people who harnessed this course of change. And finally, they were able to reach out to, to, to much broader audiences and to actually get their ears, uh, the apolitical masses. That's the biggest uh, achievement of 2020, the way I see it, to me as a social studies expert. As for the disappointments, uh, it's also related to that. Well, the biggest disappointment 
disappointment has already been voiced. It's the government, the, the powers that be, the moral quality or lack thereof, or the technocrats, as, the, as Katerina dubbed them. So they're still trying to support uh, the economy on ventilator resuscitating. Well, let's talk about us. Uh, the biggest disappointment was that everybody seemed to have exaggerated a bit uh, the shift that happened, that has happened in the society. Uh, yes, there has been a colossal shift indeed, but it, it, has, it was not colossal enough. I keep having this impression that at the backdrop of ideas and concepts, the people who are uh, generating these ideas uh, that have uh, really that, that have decided at some point that they, they have won. Uh, the, uh, the, the support to them has uh, started to dwindle. Uh, well, definitely the 3% that are claimed to support uh, the government, well, it's, it, it could be that, it could be less or, or more than that, uh, fewer people or more people than that. But still, uh, supporting of the ideas, supporting the communication, the people who are gui guiding the protests, uh, well, not, not exactly managing the protests, but guiding the protests, even the status that they used to have before May 2020. The idea was that they, they used to think that, uh, oh, finally we've won. The society hates the dictator so much that uh, he will be overthrown. But still, it didn't happen. And there's, there's a significant proportion of people who would still, well, that rigid, inert mass of people that Gennady has uh, described. They wish uh, the changes not to happen. They don't want changes. Uh, the, the crisis and the magnitude of the crisis is not the most important thing. They, they just want to go back to normal. And uh, these people are not uh, approached with any ideas, any new messages. Uh, the analysts tend to disregard that. Uh, the Belarus uh, that we've been seeing, the Belarus on the white, red, white uh, flags uh, marching on, uh, everyone down to the last person, well, that uh, dims the eyes a bit and it, it creates uh, this uh, wrong impression that everything is fine and everything is going to be fine afterwards. And the, 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 the disappointment was that uh, the attempts have been abandoned uh, to fight for, to, for the minds of the people that are still not there with the flags out there in the streets. And that's quite a significant proportion of the population we're talking here. Uh, they simply sit, uh, stand by and observe. Uh, the passive bystanders. That's the biggest disappointment for me. Other than that, I don't really realize that uh, somebody can be outside or beyond politics with the COVID crisis uh, and other stuff. One of the least understandable things. To me, well, I was disappointed as a communications expert, uh, not as a person with the failure of the government. If the COVID response had been a bit more pr productive, I don't think uh, that uh, stuff would have uh, been triggered in Belarus. The civil self-organization, yeah, it would have happened, uh, yet uh, another rigged elections would have happened and nothing would have followed. Well, I see that uh, there are unprofessional people in the government uh, who are still trying to do something uh, they, they're physically unfit to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Philip, so uh, finally we will take a break from your background music because the sound was coming a bit, quite a bit distorted. Okay, so we haven't uh, set the objective to talk about the uh, stuff not related to politics or COVID. What is the most important uh, thing. Uh, well, the three obvious uh, points have been voiced, uh, the COVID, the elections and the protests, but not, not else. Well, there are quite a lot of uh, issues uh, beyond COVID uh, uh, that have been mentioned uh, that make our picture a bit, a bit broader. Anybody wish, willing to add for the second question? Uh, the un... Uh, 
the, the non-obvious stuff that happened in 2020. Well, if there are no comments, uh, let's uh, close the topic of 2020. Let's talk about the further development, how the political and economic crisis in Belarus will develop next year. Possibly my colleagues are aware that, uh, that, that this is the toughest matter, given the prognosis uh, for the long term or for the longer term. When the events happened uh, literally overnight, things have changed overnight. So uh, what does each one of us expects uh, from the economic and political changes in 2021 in broad strokes? Uh, how forecastable is that for, for, for one year to come? I see that Andrei Kazakevich's microphone got muted again. Uh, so can, can you unmute your microphone without having to reconnect, Andrei? None. Yes. Oh, finally. Wow. It's just, I've been looking at the chat box now. Could you explain the question? Yeah, or could you repeat the question again? No, it's just uh, for, for the Brest Oblast, there's quite quite a lot of stuff. Just your outlook for 2021. When, how are we going to how are we going to win? You have one minute. Go. No, my prognosis in the end of August will be six months. No, so I don't know what's going on for me. Uh, существование не вижу. Ну, хотя бы потому, что все-таки это очень-очень дорого. Да, у нас экономический кризис, сохранение таких вот отношений неопределенных с Россией, а это очень неудобно и дорого. Отношения плохие с Западом, если посмотреть, что тоже, в общем-то, не, не дешево обходится. Это касается и кредитов, это касается и туризма, который у нас поступал где-то 250 миллионов. Долларов, ну, если брать там, туризм из, из ЕС, это вопросы окупаемости атомной электростанции, ну и многое другое, да, то есть, опять же, все это э, значит, что где-то в течение следующего года, опять же, нужно будет искать властям, даже если все как бы движется. Это нормализация, если нормализация, опять же, и в политическом климате. Может быть, даже самое важное политическое событие в нашей истории произойдет как раз в следующем году. Наша история может произойти в следующем году, а не в этом году, конечно. Спасибо, Андрей. Александр? Это сложная миссия, чтобы сидеть вокруг и говорить о будущем. Uh, especially when the system in Belarus is so unstable and the potential bifurcation points can, can, can be anywhere. It's very difficult to picture or to imagine the, the time frame, but uh, the tendency is there. 
we can see some hypothetical future that might uh, co comprise some multiple scenarios. And only just one of them will actually be realized. I've written this text about six scenarios uh, that the Belarusian events uh, can develop under. Four of them are unsustainable. So the system can become stabilized uh, when the legitimacy or some, some kind of legitimacy of that system is restored. The legitimacy over the last years was largely maintained by force, by repressions, you know, preventative authoritarian, authoritarianism, authoritarianism. Uh, so it, it couldn't have been going on for too long because in, in, in 2010, the legitimacy was gone after 2010, by and large. The legitimacy of the government can be restored only if uh, there are negotiations, so the new, new uh, elections that follow, uh, follow or, or the resignation uh, of the president leaving and uh, the new elections uh, would be run. There is the foreign influence stabilization through the Russian police intervention, but I don't think that sustainable uh, that, that scenario is sustainable either, because the situation in Russia is also becoming quite shifty quite unsustainable uh, for a whole lot uh, of reasons. The crisis of Putin's legitimacy, uh, regional conflicts and discrepancies, uh, the protests against uh, uh, the power, uh, the talks about the constitutional reform brewing in Russia. So Russia is uh, growing more and more unstable. And assuming this burden feeding belarus as feeding belarus is you know, the, the the world uh, will be pissed off by that and there will be severe sanctions uh, against russia uh, there, was, there will be domestic conflict sparked in in, in russia that this non-violent uh, protests uh, uh, might uh, no, no longer be true for belarusians but that scenario is still unsustainable, so some events uh, should happen, some, like elections uh, that can uh, bring the legitimacy to the government and uh, restore uh, the legal uh, system. But uh, the, the, yeah, there, there can be some delays, but anyway, any delay is uh, in, uh, unsustainable. I agree with Andre. Uh, well, continuing business as usual is simply un unfeasible because of the resource constraint. And there will be some public consensus, some civic consensus to be uh, achieved by the government. For that government uh, to still be running the country. The civic duty, uh, well, nobody is going to trust uh, uh, this, this, uh, quite a lot of distrust uh, to state institutions, uh, to state actors, uh, to state uh, um, officials as persons. So there's, there's a huge distrust on the part of the society. The only new, the, the only realistic scenario is the new elections. That's the desired future from my viewpoint, but it's also a motivational scenario because the situation is uh, more or less going to lead us to the new, to the point of running the new elections. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, I, I liked how you said events like elections, or uh, kind of like elections. So it's 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 a very good uh, description of our future, very vague and obscure. I've been reading at the list uh, the potential people. Uh, Twenty-five seats uh, are reserved for the security service of the president. The equivalent of the Secret Service. Yes, the, the Praetorian Guard is the most important. So 25 seats on the old Belarusian Council. Well, I don't believe that uh, the legitimacy problem will manifest somehow next year, because uh, you can still live with uh, the legitimacy you don't have, if that's your only problem. Because if uh, the president is not believed to be legitimate uh, by the bulk of the society, but we believe uh, his subordinates to be legitimate, uh, their subordinates are believed to be, uh, or this is, 
the superiors are believed to be legitimate by their subordinates and so on and so forth and, so, and we still get our marriage certificates and so we pay taxes from them well the lowest tier in that hierarchy is rank and file citizens me and you uh, we don't uh, believe uh, the top to be legitimate in this status in this situation the system can function where the subordinates uh, believe that their superiors to be legitimate uh, so there is a very clear problem of the system's own expenses, uh, own, own mistakes uh, that it has been making throughout 2020. So it's very difficult to, to imagine that 2021 will be uh, without uh, the government's uh, managerial mistakes. Everything that happened in 2020 was, was the outcomes uh, of the mistakes, uh, errors, crimes, no matter how you twist it, no matter how you spin it. Politically, the, these were mistakes uh, that the government has committed and the uh, public caught on to that. So economically, politically, it will keep, uh, they will they will keep making those mistakes. Uh, they will, the only uh, consequence of that will, will be further sparks of protest. Nobody can say where and how this is going to happen. This is absurd to be talking about forecasts like that. Uh, but I believe that there are some uh, specific points, some bifurca bifurcation points that are very important for the government. And uh, those forks, uh, those bifurcation points, uh, how the government traverses uh, them, uh, which uh, direction they choose, uh, it will channelize the process, uh, it will funnel, funnel the processes uh, the society, in the society. So if Lukashenko decides uh, to run a reform just for show, something like uh, my office will be called uh, the office of the chairman uh, of uh, the old Belarusian council. Well, that's that's one point. And uh, this is one uh, direction of the bifurcation. In that case, he will simply spark up the protest uh, of the society. That's another slap on the face. They will feel that. And, and he, he'll get the same from Russia. He'll get the same flag from Russia. Uh, there will be more pressing to the, against the government, the more stress, uh, the more stress you run, the more mistakes you make politically. And the second uh, point in that bifurcation is when Lukashenko starts some, some transit uh, trying to uh, control it in the process of the Kazakhstan, uh, akin to Kazakhstan, Kazakh transition, where he still uh, leaves, uh, ma maintains some control over the system, but uh, to a lesser extent. And he hopes that that, that uh, diminished uh, control will be enough for him. And uh, that uh, option will let the system survive a bit longer because uh, f uh, the new system for strong contradictions uh, to emerge, it might take a year or two, but still the mask will uh, get stuck to the face. And I believe that any controlled, uh, well, even, even if, if he points uh, uh, the, uh, bu the bullet clip uh, from his assault rifle, if he appoints that he is his successor that successor will still try to distance himself as far as possible from lukashenko in his politics uh, lukashenko's style of uh, hellish micromanagement inability to delegate and uh, to observe some um, ev events that he is not in control with uh, not in control of uh, the conflict between the successor and the president and the current president will will be uh, unavoidable if that successor has any powers, well, uh, those powers will be sufficient uh, to finish uh, the old obsolete regime. I believe that every scenario is bad for the government, for the current government. Uh, the, the big question is, it's, it's like the, the quiz show, which, uh, which road it will take, the, the longer, the shorter, or the, the intermediate one. It's difficult to predict that. Yes, thank you, Artyom. Both scenarios are bad, but possibly both scenarios are good. It depends on how you look at it. Uh, Katerina, what, what about the economy? What, what are the development trends? So me as an economic layman, uh, well, business as usual, and we just dump half the uh, forex reserves uh, to, to pay out the foreign loans. What are the options? Well, we have quite a lot of... Uh, controversy in the economy quite a lot of risks uh, but the spread of the uh, of the range of possibilities is, is not as dramatic as in, as in politics but the, it's it's still there in the economy the external factors uh, all of us believe uh, that the world economy is restoring after the 
in the COVID pandemic that the vaccines will work, the vaccines will work, that the, the, there will be no lockdowns in spring or so on, in summer. And this is where expectations are. Uh, the restorations uh, to a certain extent in Belarus, uh, the small and open economy, which is quite sensitive to stuff that's happening outside and beyond the country. On the other hand, we have quite a, quite a bunch of domestic risk factors. It's obvious uh, that uh, political uh, lack of political determination, lack of uh, political clear clarity, it will still uh, oppress against the situation. This does not mean that uh, tomorrow we will see that the economy collapsed. This does not mean that uh, the economy all died overnight, but there will be less investment. Uh, there will be less entrepreneurship uh, than there would have been if uh, those factors were not in play. That's a very bad uh, situation that does not lead uh, to crisis. Or well, people accuse me of uh, being the pessimist that uh, there will be no crisis. I keep saying that the crisis is good because it generates some political change. I'm not saying that the crisis will get the people out to, to protest. I don't. I cannot know that. But um, most likely, the crisis w would have been an economic motivation for the government. Uh, the economic crisis would have been a political uh, motivation for the government to reform the economy. If we did, if we stay in this flatlining GDP growth, it, there will be no decisive reforms. Uh, that's uh, that, that's a fact. A huge risk is migration. We see that uh, quite many people leave the country. Every spark of the repressions, uh, every new big point in repressions. Well, it's a clear message uh, that the situation is not going to resolve itself in the near future. We have been getting quite a lot of those signals, quite a lot of those messages that it's not going away quickly. Well, the best and brightest of Belarus, uh, people uh, that can find better life abroad, they will continue leaving the country. And it's a very difficult process because uh, the longer uh, uh, time passes uh, since their departure, the more irreversible that process is going to be. And it's, 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 it's again, not a tra tragedy of tomorrow. It's, it's not going to manifest overnight, but we will feel that uh, in five years, uh, five to 10 years time in the economy. And there are also some risks uh, that can trigger the crisis uh, the, the, literally the next day or the, the day after tomorrow. And the risks related to the consequences, to the aftermath of the coronavirus, that uh, the state-owned enterprises are rife in debt. Uh, they are still uh, operating at a negative profit, uh, operating at a loss. And that uh, loans, though, those loan, loans that they've taken out, it limits their possibility to expand the output uh, as a response uh, to the restoring demand. So that problem needs to be resolved somehow, because it does contain some prerequisites of the financial of the debt crisis of non-performing loans. So that crisis is, is always there, but uh, so far our technocrats have been managing it. Uh, when, when they fail to, when, when they stop being able to, well, we don't know that. And something that Vadim has said, the risk of currency crisis, uh, the foreign, uh, foreign exchange reserves will be sufficient to, just to repay the foreign loans the outstanding loans. In this case, uh, the role of Russia cannot be underestimated. This is hard to underestimate because uh, right now uh, it is the only external source for us. Getting the foreign currency that we need so badly because uh, the foreign currency liquidity is uh, the most, uh, or the weakest point of our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Yes, indeed, we do uh, remember, we, we do recall the, the role of Russia. Vadim? Uh, Gennady, are you with us? For the, for the forecasts, I, I'd be uh, a bit uh, unconventional here. So periodically this question comes up, when, when, uh, when are we going to celebrate victory? When is it, when is it all going to end? But for me, when I asked that question to myself, we should not be talking about uh, uh, the change, uh, talking about the prospects or expecting victory. Clearly, we want everything to end quickly. We want the president to be replaced. We want him to resign and so on. But uh, the way I see 
the question should be phrased more profoundly. The, uh, the question of reformatting not just the political system. It's the uh, 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 transformation of the state institutions and broader the social institutions. Why would I phrase the question word like the question like this? Well, it's a bit of a visionary aspect. Uh, it's it's a bit of a, a speculation, but I will allow myself that luxury. Essentially, right now we're at the stage of a phase transition for many many points. Phased transition. At new technological foundation in the economy. We're, we're also uh, on a transition path uh, to the new political system. We are recodifying the social relations, the, the social, not the political, not the, not the economic ones. The social reality is uh, reconsidered. We are at a new phase, in a new phase where the national, the, the, the notion of national is recodified. Or recorded and this uh, new paths uh, they, they're not at the bifurcation point they are already already happening they are in transition they're not it's, it's not a fork in the road so there's a big objective the big mission uh, for the Belarusians especially those abroad uh, we've indeed learned quite a lot of good things about the diaspora as uh, you know, as my colleague here has said what we've learned that Belarusians are Belarusians uh, for, for for life. Uh, well, trying to combine the two things is, is a bit visionary. I believe that Belarusians, better than any other peoples, any other people, they have the prospect of, be, of building the digital state and the digital society. They're closer than uh, the Belarusians are closer than any other country to that. It can be done quickly simply because we, we, we have so much in place already. And this resolves, this removes a whole number of intermediaries that are, that are simply irrelevant. The political, economic, even the logistical and organizational intermediaries are non, not necessary, they're redundant. And uh, a huge number of initiatives, uh, starting from the local councils, uh, of the local councils, I mean the, the neighborhood chats, uh, community chats, go into the digital the economy going digital, literally. Well, quite a lot of developments for economic assistance is already there. Well, I don't really categorize the economy, the bookkeeping and the finance. Well, there's quite a lot of changing happening there. I'm, I'm not a big expert on blockchain either, but I still realize that the, the blockchain, no, that's, uh, that's trivial already, that's details. Uh, and the point is, uh, quite many initiatives, uh, social, digital, uh, civic ones, they, they're already there. They are already in place. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a mess of business. Uh, well, it's, it's a common meme goes. But when all of this uh, gets combined and when it starts working together, this would be a huge win for everyone. Because that first functioning happening uh, started happening in the first wave of COVID, when the basic things that were there, the, the uh, mom's chats, some small town neighborhood communities, and bam, they, they went to a whole new level and they united all of Belarus. During COVID, uh, there was a huge uh, push forward, uh, post-electoral stage, post-election stage. And after that, uh, it grew to the point, uh, to the point where if and when. Well, let me take it back. In case when it combines, or the, the point in time when all of this combines, this will be a phenomenally efficient and great uh, uh, social mechanism, public-private uh, mechanism. It would be, it would be awesome. Okay, thank you, Gennady. Uh, well, we, we should have had you discussing with us last time we were discussing the future of Belarus. So feel free to invite me. Well, uh, always, always pleased to have you. Okay, visionary bits. Uh, that's uh, you. You're the go-to man. We will know that. Okay, Anatoly, can you give us the your outlook for 2021? We 
as the last speaker uh, from this wonderful panel of experts, I will have to agree, well, I will have to second most of the forecasts. I've heard uh, one girl that works in Andy and uh, 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 who works, well, who, who is a big forecaster. She, she says that, that 121 is, is going to be even worse. But I just build a matrix of events that uh, visually shows that the disastrous events are unlikely and uh, uh, the probable events are non-catastrophic in their nature, although it, it hasn't really played out last year. But anyway, after the big things, I would have said that oh, I would highlight this system building uh, processes, uh, infantile, uh, the state growing infantile, that there is some regression. You're using Fromm's terminology, a regression towards more basic or more, more primitive uh, forms of adaptation. This is what the government is doing. The fact that we're getting to the point where this uh, self-destruction of the state uh, is going to continue. The big question is how creative this process might be. And the Schumpeter has this uh, constructive self-destruction or cre creative self-destruction. Sometimes the destruction of something yields positive out positive outcome. And there's a big question how positive those outcomes are going to be because uh, the changes are happening at various levels. And I see, for example, uh, stuff that's happening to businesses in smaller towns. Uh, some shops uh, close down, some are open up, people wait for some time and they open a new business instead of the previously closed one. Well, these things are happening, but uh, not to a large scale, not, not, not large enough a scale to notice. Well, uh, to, to create something beautiful, you, you have to destroy something as beautiful. Well, that's it for my part, I guess. Thank you, Anatoly. Yeah, the regression towards more basic, more primitive forms. Well, the cutting ribbons, this, this stuff, yeah. Activity of the state is going primitive. We've been able to place uh, three questions uh, into th uh, one block per half an hour. We have the fourth block of questions. I cannot see whether there are raised hands. The, as you were reading the chat box, uh, maybe you, you've, you've had some questions that you would like to summarize, Anton. Maybe there, there was stuff about Brest, uh, the Brest Oblast, the Brest province. Uh, there was the stuff about cucumbers uh, uh, that the Brest uh, entrepreneurs are profiting from, profiting from heavily. Uh, are there any questions up for discussion for the remaining half hour? Yes, I don't see any raised hands either, but there are questions uh, into the chat box. There's a question to Katerina from Galina Kashevska. If all the events of this year had not happened, how likely would it be to carry out quick, real, actual reforms in the economy without changing the political system in principle? What or who was or is the driver of reforms in the government? Katerina, please talk about the drivers of reforms in the government. Well, a year ago, I, I would have been more optimistic in my response to this one. I believe that if not for these events, uh, all the reforms that we would have seen would have been just uh, small steps, insignificant steps, and too much pomp about liberalizing the business environment. Well, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's a good thing, but it, it would not have resolved our biggest economic challenges and problems. Uh, that primarily are about the inefficient state-run sector, state-run economy. All the reforms that have happened to date have been forced. The state, the state sector stopped generating growth. Okay, let's liberalize, let's remove some barriers in the private businesses. Uh, forced reform. Three times in a row, uh, devaluations uh, over several next years. Okay. Let's uh, get uh, the proper head of the national bank in power and uh, make them uh, give give them authority. Now there's another crisis. Okay, let's try to manage the public finance somehow. Let's bring it to order. So that's uh, untimely. 
because cutting costs uh, during the crisis is not the best idea economically. It's, it's quite the opposite uh, that should be done. But we still have to cut costs because we're simply uh, pushed to the corner. Uh, the driver of the reform in the government, well, there's, there's quite a lot of people in the government, in the national bank, the head of the national bank specifically, uh, the government, the presidential administration. Uh, there are people there uh, that are of uh, uh, liberal economic persuasion, so to speak, but they're quite limited in what they can do. They're quite limited uh, in the field of maneuver. They realize what, what has to be done, but they cannot do that because of the lack of authority. Uh, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a request, uh, yes, it's Valery Tavarevich, the administrator, yes, it's a great tactic, so if, you're, if you write your administrator, you'll be given the floor anyway, yeah, we'll, we'll give you the floor anyway, could, could you please mute your microphone, although you're the administrator, your, your Nick says that, but, uh, Mr. Karbalevich, yes, we can see and hear you now. Well, I don't know how it happens, uh, it's just, I, I cannot rename my administrator to my my first and last name. Okay, you'll be the perennial administrator then. Okay, so I'll be the boss, uh, at least here. Okay, I would like to look at the Belarusian situation uh, from a broader historical, historical uh, context, from a broader historical perspective. Uh, there is this perspective that has become established that the liberal order that has existed for two decades after the uh, Second World War is, is becoming a thing of the past. It is replaced by something uh, utterly new, completely new. The Belarusian social model was the brightest option, the brightest uh, alternative to the liberal order. It is specifically the Belarusian social model that was the attempt uh, to show the world, to show to the world that uh, quite successful development is still is still possible despite the trend, uh, despite the trend for, for democratic reforms. And for two decades, uh, this model had been yielding uh, more or less decent effect. It was talked about and the people pointed figures and said, well, it, it, it can happen in a country like Belarus, Belarus back then. Some changes can happen without breaking down the Soviet system completely, the Soviet legacy, the legacy system. The revolution, this year's revolution has delivered a very serious blow, a very important blow uh, to, to this uh, post-Soviet post utopia. It shattered this utopia. It showed that, it has shown that the Belarusian social model is, is a, a dead-end branch, is a, is a evolutional cul-de-sac. Uh, it will have a, a serious uh, effect uh, on the post-Soviet space at large. The instinctive, instinctive understanding of this uh, causes Russia to be active, uh, to, to support Lukashenko no matter what, or to, 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 to not uh, uh, the color revolution prevail in Belarus, to not let it uh, prevail, because it's a bad message, it's a bad signal for, for Russia, it's bad news for, for all the for post-Soviet space. Thank you. Thank you, Valery. Thank you for mentioning that. I would mention that once again, yes, we, 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 we hear that the color revolution term is applied to the events in Belarus. Well, uh, I don't see how this revolution is any different from any other, uh, from any other color revolution. But I fully agree with what you said when this, uh, about the shattered uh, Soviet utopia and other stuff that was obvious to us. Well, Anatoly, uh, I guess, has said that uh, the Lukashenko is the Che Guevara, is the pop icon uh, in the world, uh, but uh, people didn't know what exactly he was doing. Well, finally, get an alternative path uh, on the table where the events of 2020 are indeed uh, well, 
debunking that image of uh, Lukashenko and the Belarusian model as, as, as such. They, they bust that myth to foundation. Any, any other hands or comments in the chat box? Yes, Alexander, uh, I've seen your hand, it's just... Okay, thank you. Out of today's discussion, I have this idea to uh, award the prize for 2020 to the, to the person who had been developing and strengthening the Belarusian diaspora until, until, until today. Who is that person? Uh, Alexander Grigorievich, Alexander Lukashenko. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, the, the, the expert, uh, I, I specifically held back the name of that person. Uh, the, the, the expert on Lukashenko uh, called him called him right away. Uh, but maybe he'll, he'll also get the medal for the, the development of democracy in Belarus. Yeah, but uh, Lukashenko has done the best, uh, the, the best efforts to expand the Belarusian diaspora this year. As for Gennady's question, as for Valeri's question raised about further development trajectory, further possible paths, uh, there, there are quite a lot of people in the country who are thinking about and uh, they are talking about stuff uh, that's not uh, underst understood by many, but uh, the technological innovations uh, that are being harnessed, uh, these technological innovations come with a scientific and uh, technical progress. Uh, all the way to technological singularity, by the way. The new economy it has been dealt with, uh, modern day philosophers, and the Belarusians uh, do have a lot of advantage, a lot of bits and pieces already there. Uh, the economists, uh, the technology people, the philosophers, uh, they should all be put in the same room to try to come up with the development concept for Belarus. Because we are indeed in a phased uh, transition to something new. A phased transition to something new. But th th there is something else coming up here that needs to be uh, considered. It's the uh, Oh, you get too self-confidence, uh, it's, it's bad. Where the digital economy is so visible, you can account for everything. And uh, there is this uh, temptation uh, that we can see the future. Uh, the uh, conviction that you can see the future is a bad thing in, the, uh, in itself, because if, you, if you're too sure of that, if you're too sure of that ability. So along that path, I would caution us against uh, getting into yet another technological trap where there is uh, the temptation to deprive people of privacy as it as it has happened in china it is being done in china as we speak and to take control of everything i believe that is going to be the path uh, uh, that that will be disastrous uh, politically alexander thank you any further questions opinions Anton, can you see anything or we will call it a night, uh, even though it's a summary session of 2020. Uh, may I contribute something? Yes, Andre, about the discussion about the Brest Oblast. Все эти аргументы, они как бы известны там про огурцы и про Украину, вопрос в том, как это зафиксировать. Пока статистически как бы не получается, хотя надо работать И там еще был вопрос про элиты. Вопрос про элиты. Are there actual uh, elites in the country? No, да, там. Uh, если реальные элиты в стране в понимании so лучше понимание ценностного подхода к элитам, кто обладает uh, более высокими талантами, особенно с точки зрения 
в общем-то, well, неправильно присоединение uh, просто понимание them, этого феномена. Elites, То есть это, это те люди, которые принимают политические решения, но есть политические решения. Я думаю, это единственный критерий для, для их разделения, который является невозможным. А если мы говорим о том, что есть хорошие, есть плохие, в смысле там умные и умные, то ну, то есть, конечно, запутывает ситуацию, потому что, на самом деле, люди могут поступать плохо. И я уверен, что в репрессии в Беларуси, которые сейчас происходят, очень много умных и способных людей хорошо подключаются, то есть не мешают всякие вещи делать, поэтому... Поэтому я вообще это отбросил, да, все-таки so рассматривал вид, как те, кто question, вот, имеет возможность влиять на принятие решения, взять на занимательные uh, well, позиции, uh, take the elites. The elites are принятие решения. И касается там еще двух слов в этом вопросе про раскол или мне сам этот термин как-то не очень нравится раскол. Особенно, скажем, на разные ситуации, как такого классического раскола, когда одна часть, скажем, станет в одну сторону баррикад, а другая сторона баррикад, а ну, это вот элита, условно говоря, или там большинственная часть государственного аппарата, она просто, certain, да, certain, просто не будет участвовать в политических процессах, да, или как бы там, скажем, в репрессии, причем без такого плана, наверное, наверное возможно. Так вот, если скажем, про скол, то это, кстати, может быть одно из достижений нашего, кстати, вот здесь ни разу никто это не упомянул, да, всего года, что несмотря на все эти сложности, несмотря на острый политический кризис, мы можем говорить о том, что в обществе белорусском случился серьезный раскол, да, что это привело к именно социальному противостоянию, противостоянию между различными группами, хотя, ну, в общем-то, это прогнозировалось, и многие эксперты это ожидали, особенно после августа, ну, как после конца августа, когда началась уже как бы вот такая реакция, да, консолидация власти после, после событий 9 августа, там, и последующих. Но ну, так или иначе, все-таки мы имеем скорее противостояние между обществом so и властью, обществом и государством, а, при том, что сторонники власти, они ну, все-таки не противоставляются очень жестко противникам, и несмотря на отдельные инциденты, все-таки ну, единство, единство общества. Ну или оно само собой по себе сохранилось, но так или иначе это, конечно, очень, очень позитивно, особенно если мы вспомним, например, пример Украины. Валерий Well, she just uh, she just wanted to congratulate congratulate everyone on the on the new year and, and say that she is the elite. Yes, uh, you can we can use uh, the Wilfred Pareto's uh, elite uh, determine uh, the, the, the definition. Although the ruling coalition the ruling coalition is uh, what the political scientists operate, but the vertical lift in our case the vertical elevator is working uh, very poorly. Uh, but the horizontal carousel. The horizontal merry-go-round is revolving very, very rapidly. Uh, so you, you've you've been a healthcare minister. You, you've done a poor job. Go to Grodno Oblast. Go to run the, the the governor of the Grodno Oblast. Lukashenko also feels that uh, his politics is brutally anti-elitic, anti-elitist, uh, to avoid the formation of professional clans to not formalize any groups, uh, any bands in the government, to, uh, to, to facilitate any divide that has just been mentioned. In the Soviet Union, there was this model practiced like this. Uh, uh, so you, you're, you manage a factory, OK, next day you, you run uh, a region. Uh, although the professional criteria were, were used back then, uh, Lukashenko uh likes uh, to deal with people 
who were newly appointed and, and they don't uh, know what's going on in, in, in the domain that they're supposed to govern, in the so, so domain that they've been uh, su su supposed to manage. Lukashenko likes that, he enjoys that. Uh, he used it uh, to form uh, his own power in, in the inner circle Лукашенко's government was quite professional. Да, то есть она где-то сломалась, там где-то в десятых годах, вот, действительно, начались вот эти карусели, но до этого более-менее. But more or less it was working until then. If I may, a couple points on that one. Well, consider this, colleagues. Maybe I, I would be tougher about it. There is no elite in Belarus, or no elites in Belarus in the classical definition of the world of the word because this uh, preventative authority authoritarianism it did yield some results uh, the people of uh, critically thinking and capable of uh, thinking for themselves uh, they were removed from the decision making process on the other hand uh, the elite the social group if we use that definition it must be there uh, united by something united by communication and identification these people should realize that they belong to this group, this group, well, they, they must feel they're belonging to that group, and that group has uh, have uh, have has to have leverage and the tools to to influence the situation. So there is no such thing. There is no social group. There are uh, people who are close to Lukashenko. The inner circle. That's whole whole bunch of definitions, uh, whole bunch of terms to that. But uh, the elite, especially the political elite, it, it's it's not there. Андрей seems to disagree, but no, there is no such social. Нет, ну я все-таки ты считаешь, что ситуация гораздо более сложнее, oh, есть понятие бюрократии, социальными традициями, правами и так далее. Говорить о том, что, скажем, они не влияют на решения, особенно, скажем, перевод своего или перевод своего региона там и так далее. Ну, совсем. Реальная ситуация гораздо более сложная. Что по региональному уровню мы можем это видеть? Там, да, когда там, скажем, есть определенный пул там. В городе или в районе. И там очень сложно вообще даже как ну, нарушить эти там, правила бизнеса, они там спаяны там, да, и всего прочего. И поэтому, ну, so very, ну, нет, конечно, да, то есть, together. наверное, такой вот элиты, как там, не знаю, в Соединенных But Штатах или даже indeed, в России, the elite, uh, как like вот группы, или объединенные, в общем, какие-то правила и ценности у нас нет, в смысле, что они только, да, то есть это все прославно. Но я бы не описывал ситуацию так, как очень просто, да, что есть там просто какой-то набор людей, приближенных к ней, там все заканчивается. Но все реально гораздо сложнее. Группа людей, приближенных к ней, там все заканчивается. Но все реально гораздо сложнее. Группа людей, приближенных к ней, там все заканчивается. Of the inner circle, it's, it's everything is much more sophisticated. It, uh, the reason is you have different professional paradigms. You have the political scientist approach and the, and the analyst approach. Yes, it has been interesting to consider this from various perspectives. I, I've also seen uh, Philippe's uh, Becano's uh, uh, comment about uh, his in agreement uh, about the uni uh, unity of the society. So what are, what what is your take on that? There is no unity in the society. Let me try to leave the cafe to to not distra distract, to, to, to not irritate you with the background music. Let me try to leave the place. Right. As for the preservation of unity is concerned, maybe I didn't understand Andre correctly. Uh, there is no such thing as unity in the society right now. There are people who are prepared to sacrifice everything, literally everything. Uh, the chats, uh, community chats, the sociological observations uh, that Andrei Vardamaski has done. Uh, there are clear groups. One group wants Lukashenko to leave. They're prepared to, to uh, go for sanctions, to opt in for sanctions, uh, swift to be disabled, uh, economic damage. Uh, to, they, they, they're prepared to uh, suffer through some economic hardships uh, when uh, Lukashenko leaves. Uh, there is also a group uh, that is dispersed, uh, that is quite numerous. It's, it's uh, well, it's not music, well, somebody is starting an engine next to my microphone. 
So there are some people who don't want Lukashenko to leave. Uh, there are not too many of them, but they're dispersed. They're not, not quite active because the communication channels uh, used by people like us, uh, they, they're simply not represented there. But they have still not vanished. They have not gone anywhere. They see the world uh, a bit differently. At the same time, there is a third group, people who just want everything to end, regardless of the fact that they sympathize to the first group, those who want to Lukashenko to leave. They will not be too uh, disappointed if Lukashenko does not leave and everything just goes back to normal. Everything goes back to business as usual. Conceptually, uh, the society is united uh, by two big things, uh, non-violence uh, and uh, independence. Independence and the lack of violence. The, but again, there is the bastion of Lukashenko. Uh, somebody believes that the opposition is, uh, opposition is have, not been, have not been beaten up enough, even that. So I don't see the public consensus. I don't see the unity in the society. It's just a, a conflict that is being suppressed. And if for some reason that hand that is holding the baton and is just monopolizing the conflict, uh, trying to beat up everything who's trying to protest, uh, just a conflict between them and the part of the society that is uh, protesting, when that hand is weaker, we will not see any consensus in the society. I'm, 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 I'm almost sure of that. So it's just some attempts uh, to find ways for national reconciliation because there are people of completely opposite views. Some indirect indicators uh, is that uh, the white, red, white flag, uh, quite few people support it. Uh, the dynamic for the official red and green flag is, is not uh, a bright one, but there is a gloomy situation with the national symbols, with the white, red, white flag, except it's widely. Okay. I don't see any prerequisites uh, for the reconciliation. Uh, I, I see many factors uh, for polarization, on the, on the other hand. Okay, thank you, Philip. Anyway, Andrei, maybe, maybe we'll talk about it. Yeah, it's, it's a question of terminology. What, what is the benchmark? Because there are various groups in Belarus, uh, there are political contradictions. When I was talking about the divide, I was talking about the social conflict. Ну, well, между этими группами, да, когда есть, ну, как, ну, вот, есть конфликт видимый между социальными группами, да, например, сторонники Лукашенко мобилизированы, да, а противники Лукашенко мобилизированы, между ними постоянно происходят какие-то какие противоречия, какие-то эксцессы, и, ну, и проявление насилия, да, вот, я не знаю, может быть такой вариант в будущем или нет, надеюсь, что нет, но то, что это не произошло, за последние четыре месяца это все-таки очень, очень позитивно. Это, я, именно это я имею в виду, я когда говорю, что такого глубокого раскола А ведь это был, например, в Украине в 2014 году, да, вот это, там, где все-таки озлобленность или, скажем так, политические противоречия привели к тому, что это вылилось в насильственное противостояние между различными регионами, сторонниками политических сил внутри одних и тех же городов. Traveling in Minsk, there was this uh, thought that I spontaneously had. Uh, well, putting the official flags, the green and red uh, flags, uh, around every possible place, uh, it's becoming a bit of a cult. I haven't seen that. It's 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 not an information bubble. I haven't seen someone put up the uh, red and green flag in the window of the home, not the official institution. Yes, I saw that uh, Dmitry Baskov uh, used to live quite uh, close uh, to me. There, there, was, there, there was a flag on his balcony. Okay, right, so these people, it's clear, clear, clear about them. Thank you, thank you for the example. 
but there, uh, these are sporadic cases. They're, they're trying to ban the white, red, white flags, but uh, the, the, the people are not too keen to put up the official ones either. Okay, uh, I, I'm sorry for butting in. Everybody wants to, to, to go to good dinner now. There are no uh, red and green flags uh, because the people who would have been putting them up in their windows, uh, they, uh, they're not really the minority, uh, but uh, if uh, the government was seized by Alexander, if the power was uh, assumed by Alexander and his colleagues uh, from the Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's team, I believe we would have seen the Renaissance. Uh, this would have become this would have become uh, a movement, uh, the red and green movement, red and green flag movement. Uh, well, not necessarily they would have won, but they they would believe that uh, uh, they, they, their country was stolen from them, like by Gorbachev. They were sure that uh, even in 2020, the red and the, the white, red, white flag uh, the, the, were the one the, were the marginals. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a fascist coup d'etat happening in your country. Would, would you be happy about that? No, uh, I would. I would have taken to the streets if I were them. If uh, if uh, the, the country reverses its factor completely, 180 degrees. Well, I would. Just uh, sorry, I I I haven't yet uh, voiced uh, my point. These people are completely immobilized. They're, they're not mobilized. We don't see the anti-Maidan, uh, like there the was a case in, uh, the, 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 there was an attempt uh, to, to build a column of the, like that in Uruchi, uh, in the neighborhood. Well, I'm a skepticist, uh, but uh, these people will still be there and they will say that uh, we have sold the country, uh, we have sold the country, we are fascists and so on and so forth. But they're not capable of mobilization like the other side with the white and white, white, white side. Okay. Philip, yes, actually, you've just devaluated my comment because uh, you, you said exactly what, what I what I was going to say. So I would. Uh, нет, ну я с целом согласен, да, но кроме того, что все-таки эмоциональная связь сторонников Бучи Б со своим флагом и сторонников красно-зеленого со своим, она разная. Надо говорить, что это как бы такие симпатичные вещи, потому что даже в разных той системы, которую мы имеем, не было практики того, чтобы, например, вот эти люди покупали за свои деньги красно-зеленые и вешивали в своих домах. Вот БЧБ, как практика такая была, да, то есть люди за свои деньги покупали, где там вывешивали в квартиру и так далее. Я даже, ну, знаю все-таки много людей, которые сторонники являются, не видел такой вообще культуры, да, связи с этим с флагом, да, слушай. Лукашенко, да, с государством, да, но с флагом, ну, как, 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 как бы не очень, да? Хотя, конечно, потенциал есть, да, и, возможно, он потом будет ассоциировать именно с каким-то хорошими годами. Но есть, опять же, пример Советского Союза, где советская символика маргинализировалась очень быстро. Вроде бы, там, скажем, на 88 год, наверное, там большинство населения считало бы это своим в Советском Союзе. В конце 91-го это уже дальше и дальше началось меньшинство. Процентов, но в итоге мы сейчас, наверное, вообще людей Поэтому здесь вопрос даже не то, что там политический взгляд людей, а то, как они воспринимают понятие символа политического. И вот за 25 лет нормального такого да, связи эмоциональной со сторонниками, даже Лукашенко, с этим флагом, ну, скорее всего, нет. Да, или было, скажем, среди, среди мужчинцев. И в этом вот, ситуация отличается от того, что мы имеем с другой стороны в отношении к Okay, 
there is something to, to be proved to these people that this flag is their values is, is valuable to them should be valuable to them they don't see the issue like this in the first place all those public polls about uh, uh, research about who who uh, or which which flag do you believe to be yours I cannot really say that these people should emphasize uh, their link uh, with the uh, official flag because uh, this is taken care of very well by the government. Andrei has also said that not too many people were keen to put up uh, put up the uh, Soviet Union flags uh, when the Soviet Union was still there. But now there are people marching with these official flags, uh, hanging them out, but there are not too many of them. Mildly speaking, no. it's what what Artyom has said. Может быть, просто, чтобы больше затягивать не буду, очень кратко. В Советском Союзе была четкая связь между государством и флагом. Как только государство упало, все сразу же сменили флаг. Ну, все, в смысле, большинство, да? Вот вопрос, сработает ли эта схема в Беларуси? Я не уверен, я не знаю, да? Но очень похоже, да, что для большинства, которые поддерживают красно-зеленый. Like это именно the связь с государством, support, это связь с режимом, да, вот, который был там последние 20 лет. И вопрос, будут ли они вообще ассоциировать себя с этим флагом после того, как это государство, скажем, ну, там исчезнет, либо трансформируется. Flag, вопрос открыт, я опять же не буду утверждать, что такого не будет, но пример Советского Союза именно это показывает. Была очень четкая связь между государством и флагом, который выдешивали эти государственные институты. До этого института упали, сразу же So when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the the symbol, the, the flag, became more marginalized. Yes, there was a comment from Gennady, I think. Yeah, just a, a small comment for the future, rather. What's the point? Uh, we don't really know the side of the electorate uh, that. Uh, is uh, for Lukashenko or against the protests. It's it's very heterogeneous uh, in itself. I've been trying to find such people among my uh, broader circle. Uh, they're very close. Non-structured non interviews simply doesn't work for them. When I locate one or two people uh, like that who, who are against the protests uh, or are for the president, uh, they they are not prepared for a dialogue. They're not prepared to get in, to engage in a meaningful conversation about that. This is what I found. They're very scared of losing uh, the world, the picture of the world that they have in their mind. They don't want it to go. Uh, so among the people that I've, I've, I've been able to talk to, there are clear proponents of the person, personalized regime, the, the Lukashism, as, uh, as they say, uh, the advocates of the charisma, of the well, wrong charisma, whatever. Uh, there are advocates of the system who say that it's, imp it's not perfect, uh, but any system for, for them is, is better than the revolution that is going to break down everything. But as soon as the, another system is offered to them, they will, they will simply go uh, or switch, switch to that one and work nicely. So there are many people who are uh, supporting, not supporting uh, the system uh, with a certain uh, degree of risk they're willing to take to change. But that risk uh, for the flag, I don't think it will be relevant uh, two or three years after the regime has changed because that flag has virtually nothing to carry with it. It's not linked personally to Lukashenko, it's not linked to the, to the Soviet legacy, to the Soviet background. And the Soviet background, the farther along we go, the, 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 the more the limited uh, the percentage of population who supports it uh, remains. There are fewer and fewer people like that. Well, who's going to recall it? Uh, the, these people, they, they have seen that uh, the, the, the driver of the pol police wagon or the Aftazak was was using the official flag to clean the windshield. And the fact that it's it's being hung to the opera house, uh, to the stores, uh, to, to, to the public buildings, well, uh, this is just uh, well claiming that it is ours. Well, the people who have put it out according to the order 
as, as long as that order is overturned, they will remove those flags happily. In a way, I feel sorry for the red and green flag that uh, uh, well, uh, the, the neighbors were f f feeling envious about because there was some 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 national symbol, some national ornament. Well, now it's no longer this the state symbol. This is the symbol of the aftazak of the police of the police uh, vehicle for the detained. So, well, big thanks, big kudos to, uh, for that to Lukashenko and his PR people. Yes, it's, it's been a content reach uh, discussion indeed for the flags and the symbols and the meanings. Well, there, there is something I would like to say uh, to close the conversation. Well, if any of our speakers wishes to elaborate, uh, no problem. In a nutshell, like a New Year wish or a brief farewell, yeah, this, this opportunity is still there. It's not clear when we're going to see each other uh, next, uh, but uh, I'm very positive that we will do so in the format of the Expert Analytical, Analytical Club. I wish everyone, no matter what comes, to greet the new year in a happy setting. I would. Uh, there are people this year. Alana, uh, uh, who is uh, who was uh, in our discussion? Uh, who is uh, who, she was attending our discussion, uh, but now she's spending time in prison. There are, there are our press club colleagues uh, who who have not yet been uh, convicted yet, but they will most likely uh, greet the new year in the prison cell. Uh, but uh, I wish uh, that. Uh, uh, our uh, experts uh, of the analytical club uh, will never end up behind behind bars. We will just know them about the, as the analysts of the Belarusian uh, uh, Belarusian uh, uh, analyst club, not the political prisoners. Okay, dear friends, uh, it's been enjoyable for me to participate in this discussion. I realize the extent to which the country has changed. And it's very important for us uh, to contemplate all this, to understand all this, to take the right uh, path. I see that our country has uh, huge prospects uh, uh, before it. I wish you a happy new year. I wish you a good set of changes to our, our colleague Artem Schreiber and the rest. Uh, bon appetit. Thank you. Valeria, well, it's quite easy. Uh, the New Year's uh, wish is uh, the same for the country, but uh, may, it, uh, may it come to you know it as soon as possible. Yes, as soon as possible. And I will join your wish. Both thumbs up. All thumbs up. Well, all of us want that. Valeria has said that there is one wish for the, for the entire country, and we want it to come true. Okay, Anton, technical, non-technical, personal stuff you'd like to elaborate, uh, to, to, to like to contribute, some wishes for the future. No, I would also second second this uh, one wish, the single wish that all, all all of us have. Okay, on that optimi on that uh, important note, uh, happy New Year, everyone many new and happy meetings uh, in new Belarus in the new year. Uh, I wish to thank all the participants of our discussions this year. They have been quite diverse, quite unexpected. Uh, the, this uh, holiday season has become the time for uh, the expert uh, session. So may we have more pleasant topics to discuss. Uh, long live Belarus. Happy New Year. Until we see each other again. Happy, happy holidays. Thank you.